Thank you for joining us on the Frank Sontag podcast. We are about to get into part two. Uh, if you missed the first one, obviously go to the usual social media sites to watch them. This is a very special podcast, though. It's not only my first guest, but a very dear friend. I love immensely. Many of you may recognize her. She has been in the entertainment industry for decades, recently won an Emmy. Where's the statue, by the way? Unbelievable. Oh, I can't believe I forgot to bring Allie it. I Bell promised this guy would bring it. It's so heavy. Well, you were, uh, when I watched the video, I'm like, it's hard to I didn't realize Emmys were that big. Which they're, it's not only big, but they're really heavy. And this one's kind of cool because it's the 50th anniversary of the Emmys. So um, it has the 50th thing on, you know, on the gold with your little name and pretty. So <laughs> the, the way we ended part one, we're just going to kind of jump to somewhere else where I'd think I'm being led. Holding that statue, my guess is, and I don't know you that well, but as a hey, you do. sister in Christ, I, I know you pretty good. <laughs> you Every time you call me, the timing is always like, <laughs> here's where I'm going. Holding that statue, I suspect not only was surreal and the night and the timing, but I've been in the movie industry from afar. My dad was in the industry for decades. And I saw men and women strive. Their whole life was about winning a, an Oscar. Hold it. Here's where I'm going. I, I Holding that statue probably wasn't like the fruition, the, the finality of a lifelong endeavor of, of acting for Allie Mills Bean. It was just like, wow, this is pretty trippy. Here I am. Now, now I'm being acknowledged, acknowledged in 60 plus, plus years of the industry. Um, I, guess I guess where I'm going is, have you always strived to be acknowledged by your peers and nothing was your life? I never got that. No. Even though. The, the but it's still trippy. Well, you, <laughs> but no. It's the character you played on General Hospital. Yeah. I mean, once in a while, not that long ago. Pretty crazy. Somehow I'd be on, I'm like, oh my gosh, Allie's out of soap. Allie's a little wacky. <laughs> this is quite a character. But obviously to do that for 60 years, you love the crowd. I do. What's it about acting? I, I went to acting school for a while. You may not know that. And I studied Meisner and w w was in a couple of small movies. And Huh? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's, it's not, not for everybody. No, it's not. I mean, there's two things. There's acting. And then there's the business. Yes. Those are two very different things. Yes. So the theater, but even the theater, you know, when you get to Broadway and Tony's and all that, there's a, there, it's, it's got a lot of that stuff in there too. It's like, you know, this is where men fall, not men, but you know, mankind is ego. You know, like that's been a big battle of mine my whole life. For me, it's like overcoming insecurity, which is still ego. It's like when you don't care, when you just love and you do what you love, then you're not afraid. So it's the ego is like something that, you know, we struggle our whole, you know, Orson, we, we, 91 years you fight to get totally, he was totally free the last week of his life, by the way. Amazing. I could see it. And I didn't know he was going to die. But, um, you know, it, it's a it's a battle to challenge the lesser parts of our nature and wanting to be recognized by your peers is a lesser part of our nature. You know, no, loving what you do is, is fantastic. And you can tell the actors that just love what they do. I once ran into Jack Lemmon on the beach when I was young and, and Anthony Hopkins at a lanai in Hollywood when he was coming to do, I think it was playing Peter in one of those religious movies or something way, you know, when I was in my twenties, a long time ago, they loved acting and they had no egos. They were not egotistical people. You could, you can smell it. And then smaller people are all like, oh, hello. You know, they're better than you. They're better than you. You're saying that your father was a grip, right? Or gaffer, gaffer. You know, it's like the crew, what would we be without the crew? But a lot of times actors think that they're the big ones in the village, you know, and you can smell it. You know, I worked with Betty White. No ego, zip, zip, -dee -doo -da. just kind to everybody, loved what she did, you know. So, um, no, I, I've never, I've never wanted, I, I've, I've never, actors can submit themselves to be nominated for 
any award. And when I was doing the other soap, they kept saying, do you want to submit yourself? And I was like, no, no, not no. It's not like, no. So I didn't. And the wonder year is the reason I was never submitted is because it wasn't a comedy really. And that was the category we were in. We won after the pilot for best comedy. And I, I didn't know that we were, that had a chance from just, and I was brand new. So I said to Dan Laurie and I were drinking champagne and all of a sudden at the end, because it's the last category of the Emmys, I went, Dan, we were the only ones there because Fred wasn't there. The producers weren't there. I said, we're going to win. I mean, I, I knew it as clear as day. I said, sober up really fast. <laughs> and my shoe fell off when I was going up the aisle and I got to receive that Emmy. But I never nominated myself because it was like, I'm not going to win against you know, Saturday Night Live comics or even Murphy Brown was on. I can't remember what the other, but there were a lot of great comedies on opposite The Wonder Years. So this was, uh, it was a very profound experience for me. I, I just felt so grateful. I felt so grateful. It was like, I do care that I've been in this business for 70 years. It feels great to be holding this thing as just a symbol of hanging in and battling the lesser things so that I could do what I loved. Two, Two things. things. Um, I'll go with the earlier one. Um, the Wonder Years, obviously, was, was a wonderful show, spoke to a lot of people. So the writing, yeah. amazing. Many of us, that was uh, oh, beautiful part of our lives. But, but fast forward, forward now, when I saw the video of you accepting the Emmy and you started to talk, this is what struck me. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I want to talk about Bam in a little bit. Okay. Like, oh my gosh, Ellie's got some preacher in her. Because you just kind of started in a roundabout round way sharing the gospel without sharing the gospel when you're talking about the light. The world needs to hear the gospel, but I think part of my struggle is so much of the world is not right with God. So the moment they hear anything, about God or Jesus, they're like, not for me. And I'm not saying we have to find a new way to share the gospel, but to talk to people in real sense, in ways in which, uh, I mean, Billy Graham said the gospel is, um, it, it divides, it causes you to choose when you really preach the gospel. So a lot of people dispel that. Mm. But you were up there talking about light and and, and just loving people. And I'm like, if there isn't a time we don't need to speak like that and live like that and emulate that, I don't know what we're doing. And so that really stood out to me when you got that Emmy. So I wanted to acknowledge that. And I'm excited for you for what is to come from this day on. We never know. No, certainly don't. Never. I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm just going to say yes. Because, I, because you know, I'm in a different, like you said, a different season. In terms of... of that speech. First of all, I didn't. I didn't look to see how long you're allowed to speak. So at, at first, I thought, if I do win this, what would I say? And I knew that I was. I I was in such a place of gratitude, leading up to this. About a month of really a lot of growth and battles and just, you know, a General Hospital was an amazing experience for me because I, I had no fear, and I've had fear my whole life. And it was like, really like a miracle because it's like love casts out all fear. I kept thinking about that concept. And so how does a character that's killing people operate from love? But she does because she was so hurt. She wants to get rid of all the mean people. And that makes sense to me, actually. I mean, some of us would love to just curse out all the people that are really nasty. You know what I mean? And she gets to no filters. But I got to this set the first day and I went, I am not afraid at all i just like and the the head guy frank valeni remember i i said to him thank you for seeing me that first day he came up to me looked me in the eye and i just went this is like a theater he sees my soul and i'm chained to the bed going who do you have to <laughs> screw it again <laughs> like that and he looked at me and went whoa he said you got a lot of light and i just went who are you and he was the the head guy at General Hospital, I never met him. We were all wearing masks, it was the pandemic. But I had no fear, Frank, and it was like the liberation I called, we were talking, you were talking about Bam earlier, I called her from the car and I went, this is a miracle for me at then 70. It was like, 
I loved the theater, but I, I, my heart's always pounding, and I, I still cared that people liked me. And my, it's like all going away because I think Orson's gone, and ev everything's shifting in meaning. And it's like I can't be useful if I'm caring what people think. When I went to acting school, my acting teacher said something so profound to one guy in the class. Uh, I went to Playhouse West in the Valley, yeah. and uh, we had some names come out of the, the 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 school. But one guy wanted to be an actor, and so he asked the teacher, I, well, what do I do to become an actor? And Tony Savant, who's now in Philadelphia, said to him, well, act. So go to, go to a nursing home and just of act. Of course, when I said... You know, it's, it's it's not hard to do. Yeah. But this kid had in his mind, I want the spotlight. I want to be there. And, and then that always stuck with me. me. Yeah. And we studied Meisner, which obviously is a different type of technique, repetition. But but here's what I want to ask you. The last time I saw you and O, you guys were kind of doing plays in Venice. Yes. And there is something about live theater when we would do our uh, acting at Playhouse West. It's all, you know, live. And it, it, there, there's something powerful about live theater. Um, I think where I want to go, and then we'll pause and do one last one about God, really talk about walking with God. To do theater with your husband, uh, crazy, easy, hard. I mean... What? We, we went, went to a play, play that you guys did. did. It was, was amazing. amazing. Was that our two, mer two, what, two man show, the autobiography, or was it a play? I think it was the two man, two -man show. Yeah, Orson wrote that. And then I said, Well, I need to write my part. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, but your voice is your voice. Yeah. And if we're standing out there in front of people in the audience and I'm telling my life story, I can't sound like you. Mm -hmm. It just, I will feel fake. So, we took, I took a whole month with the director and he said to Orson, we're just not going to see you for a month. And he walked me through and we just changed all the words. I did what Orson wrote in terms of what, what he picked from my life. Cause he's such a great storyteller, but I made it, you know, like my voice and, um, uh, but doing plays with Orson, it was usually just wonderful. I mean, every once in a while, <laughs> like with this play, because I went, no, I don't want to say it like that. Or I don't want to put in that part. And he'd say, I'm the writer. And I'm like, yeah, but it's me standing up there. And so, you know, there's that kind of stuff that gets, you know, Orson and I had our, our share of battles because <laughs> we both have a lot of ghosts and we worked through them all, you know. Um, but but mostly like doing plays together, we would just have so much fun, especially Irish plays. We were We loved it. We were up to no good doing Irish plays <laughs> together. I can imagine. Yeah, I I love doing live theater, and it's it's wonderful to you know look at, across the stage and there's, you know, your best friend, yeah. love of your life, standing there, and you're in another character. Yeah. We did a thing where he played the devil and I was a witch. It's a famous old American play. I'm trying to think of the name of it. I can't think of the name. It'll come. Yeah, the Scarecrow. That's what it's called. Al Pacino was the original Scarecrow. And on Broadway, and it's a, uh, and so at the top I've got like I'm boiling, and I have crows, and and he's Beelzebub, really fascinating. That was real. That was one of real was a great play that we did together. Speaking of that type of a scenario, when I got to know O a little bit and you, the issue of faith definitely was kind of talked about, and I. I don't remember. It's not important the specificity of what happened, but it seems to me one time I had you in and O called in on the phone. Yeah. And said something along the lines of, I don't know, I passed the test because I, I, I had the right way of presenting the question about God or something. I don't remember the nuts and bolts, but what I'm thinking about now is you were a household, you and Orson being. You guys loved the Lord above all. You were a God-fearing household. And yet, two prominent actors from Hollywood with many decades of sustaining success to have a home, 30 years you two were together, and, and God is at the, the, the center of it? 
Well, he, you know, he wasn't at the beginning. I was a Buddhist when I met Orson. Correct. Yeah. As I was for when I was a new age. Uh -huh. Wow. We chant to nobody. <laughs> it works out real well. That's the savior of the world. So what about God in your marriage? How did all that go down when you eventually became saved? And I know O had his way of viewing God. Well, but Orson grew so much. I mean, when I met him, he just loved Jesus in particular. Yes. Because he'd had a experience. Yes. I think you know that, right? Yeah. I mean, I should I talk about that or I don't know. If you're led. I don't know. I don't know. He, Orson never liked to talk about it that much because he didn't want to seem like he was different or like it was in any way prideful. But he, he was extremely devastated at a point in his life. Um, he was very much in love with his second wife, Carolyn, the mother of his children, except one child. And um, and so uh, he was scared that he was going to become an alcoholic or just get so depressed that he wasn't going to be able to move. And he was in an apartment in New York. And, and Orson doesn't ever lie about anything, and he doesn't hallucinate. And someone was standing in that apartment just with unconditional love and made him want to live. Didn't say anything. And then it happened again, like about, I, th I think, like a week or just days, not in the next day. And I said, didn't you, like, start reading the Bible? And, like, go to church? He went, no. I said, you weren't curious, like, what he'd said when he was on the planet? He went, no, I didn't need to. I'd experienced unconditional love, and I knew that I needed to walk in that. And I just went, he's so different than me, Orson. He has an IQ of over 200, just a brilliant man, brilliant. But his heart was like he'd been so wounded by the suicide of his mother as a little boy, which is, you know, why he ran away and became a comic when he was little. And that experience for him, it was it just, it just was. So that was then his reality. And it's like, oh my God, love is real. And it's, you know, kind of tangible. I seemed completely like three, three dimensional real. And he told me that. And I was a Buddhist when he said that. And I went, wow, that's, that's a trip. But I knew he was telling me the truth because he's not a liar. And I went, that's fascinating. Huh? So he just showed up. Huh? And then I became interested, you know, and, and, um, but I was still a Buddhist. And then there were things, it was a very, very interesting transition. I mean, there were just things, again, in the ego world, when there is no God, when, when, you know, when you're just chanting about doing, you know, beautiful, beautiful things and wanting them to, to but, but there's no, there's no God involved. Egos can also get really, you know, um, ignited, right? Because it's you. So if you chant really hard and something amazing happens, it's kind of like, I mean, that's the, the the problem that I, right? So then I just began to read and I began to read the Bible because I got curious. And that's how it sort of began. And then as he said, I left him in his dust. <laughs> <laughs> Allie Mills Bean is my guest. We got a break uh, shortly here. I don't know if you know this. Did you know who Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh was? No. No. The what? The ba ba the Boggy, we called him. No. Had a big deal going on in Oregon. I got. Oh, I know about the guy in Oregon. 80 summer. The happy what? The happy guy? The happy dude. I heard about him. And then we found out what he was really happy. Yeah. They just. Wasn't it young girls? Yeah, yeah, some other stuff too. Uh -huh. uh, yes, I do know about him. Just did a special on him. And also, the, I, I'm. I'm Relating to my days of Buddhism, when you talk about that, and the Dalai Lama. I mean, I saw him probably 30 times. Amazing. Amazing human being. Laughter. Yeah. The whole thing. Very smart. Searching. Yeah. And, and it worked for me until I got to a place of realizing. Is that who you sort of followed? It was the Dalai Lama? Yeah. It's a different kind of Buddhism, Tibetan. It's, but it's, he, I saw him too. Here's a very funny quick story, and then we'll break. Okay. So Richard Gere, when I did my late night show on KLOS, I had heard Richard Gere listened and wanted me to have his uh, his teacher on. And I used to say yes to about everything. The teacher was a guy named Gelag Rinpoche. Oh, 
Okay. I know everything about him. So you know he doesn't speak English, right? I did not know that that's who Richard Gere followed. That's who Richard Gere followed. So I agree to have his move on. Last minute, Richard doesn't show up, but Gaylight comes in. He sits down. I'm going to do an hour interview with a guy that doesn't speak English. And I'm like, this is going to be interesting. But I had Gaylight on for a while. So I was drawn to Tibetan and Buddhism and all that, not to go too long here, but here's the point of the story. I got to a point where I realized self-actualization, self-realization, too much self, myself, I'm the problem. So I reached a crossroads, and then I had a Jesus experience myself where he said, pick up your cross and follow me. So that was it for me. But Buddhism is very appealing. It's very oh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful philosophy. Yep. I mean... If you don't know God, which obviously the Buddha, you know, the the young prince in, in India didn't, yeah. it's it's very much the same principles. It's that, you know, all, all, all causes are towards, you know, beautiful, loving things, and they're going to come back to you. Yeah. But but it's just missing the creator of the universe. That's all. And when I started thinking about that, I, I knew I had to say thank you. I mean, we're looking out this window at this. It's like, I'm a big nature freak. And it's so important to be grateful and to recognize, you know, what created everything to me. Anyway. Well, let me, let me say how grateful <laughs> I am that you're here. <laughs> Allie Mills Bean is my guest. We're going to pause quickly and come back with our last segment with my guest, Allie Mills Bean, on this, the Frank Sontag podcast. Frank Sontag here. One thing I want to make mention of that, that I don't enough. Um, we have a men's ministry, KMG Ministries, and as in Kingdom Men's Gathering. And uh, this is done part and parcel with the men's ministry. We do events, we do retreats, we do Bible studies, leadership courses. And it's my heart and my right-hand guy, Pastor Mike Johnson. We, um, we think the largest crisis in America and the world, for that matter, is uh, men not being men. And when you talk about a biblical man, knowing who you are in Christ, um, it's a game changer. And the last thing I'll say about KMG Ministries, other than please go to our website and support us with prayer or any other way, the missing link, I'm convinced, in men's ministry, in Christian men's ministry, is men are not taught and don't realize that they are loved by Father in heaven, Father God. When Jesus walked the planet, was baptized, Holy Spirit descended. God said, this is my son who I'm well pleased with. We walk around in this world with father wounds. Dad wasn't there. We struggle. We, we become Christian. But we don't understand nor have a relationship with God the Father, our Papa, Abba Papa, who loves us as his sons. He's raising up a whole generation of men to be sons of the Most High God. He'll heal you by the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. This is something that we teach in our ministry called sonship. One of the most important things I think the body of Christ is missing in this day and age. We as men need to know you are his son. You may not have had a dad in this life, but you have the father of the universe loves you right now and wants to use you for his glory. So KMG Ministries is our heart, um, and we uh, challenge all men to step up and discover the plan and purpose that they have um, through God in their lives, whether they know him or not now. God knows you, and we pray that you will seek him out and uh, surrender to, to those two words, who is alive more than ever now. His name is Jesus Christ. And he's waiting for you. He's knocking at the door. All you have to say is, yes, I want in. And then your life will change forever. In Jesus' name. KMGMinistries.com. You can find us also through uh, an easy website with my name, FrankSontag.com. God bless you.